weird internet stuff happening. So, live video take three. You can see that um, with my spoon blank, I leave a fair amount there. And that's because it's easy enough to remove it with the knife. It takes less than a minute to trim to this line with the knife. And the risk of ruining a spoon blank by pushing the axe too far um, is significant. So I tend to stay a millimeter or two away from the line that I've drawn. Not always, sometimes I go right up to it, but. And then the very first step is carving around that outline, just as though I was taking it to a bandsaw. In fact, if I had a bandsaw, I might use it for this stage because um, that's exactly what I'm doing, is just creating a 90 degree plane to that. So, um, this area right here back in the neck is where most people say that they over carve a spoon. And I think one of the most useful things you can do right now um, at, at this stage of, of carving a spoon in this early part of the process is to just not try and get it perfect. You can see it's all ragged and rough and it really doesn't matter. The, what's more important is that I don't over carve it. So now with less than you know, a minute or two in, I've basically trimmed myself right up to that line with no risk of ruining the spoon blank, which would have had much more risk if I tried to do it with the axe. So there's really no point in pushing the axe too far. Um, that being said, if you're too cautious and you don't push your axe work far enough, you do end up sort of wasting a lot of time. Um, so, Uh, I figure this one I'm going to be talking about the spoon carving process, guys, because I haven't done one of those in a long time, and I feel like it's useful for people. So, and also my phone is uh, doesn't have any photos on it, which means I'll be able to save it and post it to YouTube. So that'll be useful. So one of the reasons I always do this curve bit at the top, um, A, I like how it looks, but the other is that when I press this into my chest, the fact that I've knocked off those corners makes a huge difference in how comfortable it is. So now I have the spoon blank cut to the outline and you can see it's still quite thick and part of why I leave it thick is that you can see how there is a, a bit of a twist that needs to be taken out. Right? You can see the rim on this side is a little uh, higher both in the front and in the back. Um, so now I'm going to cut this top profile. And you can see how I've left this fairly thick, which gives me lots of room to do whatever sort of um, shape I want. And one of the reasons I like the tone, the, the thumb flip, the tail flip, that, that sort of comes up and around your thumb when you put it like that, is that it just naturally happens from carving. You can make that cut that starts shallow and then gets deeper and deeper, and that will naturally in just a couple of cuts create that tail flip right there. So it's just a natural part of carving down the spoon. It sort of wants to do that anyways. And then whether I leave this flat, whether I bring it down and then have it come up, that's uh, sort of a combination of what I'm feeling in the moment and also what the wood is willing to do because how far down I can dive into the grain without running into the grain going the other way has a lot to do with how steeply I angled this part of the spoon into the log to begin with. The steeper I angle it in, the more wiggle room I have to do big dips and stuff without running into grain running the opposite direction because I want this cut to flow all the way from the tip of the handle all the way down to the spoon bowl being able to be cut in one direction. Now if I've leaned it down into the wood sufficiently, I can do a whole bunch of curvature without having to change the direction of my knife. But if I haven't, if if this has been a very shallow cut into the wood, then that limits the amount of curvature I can do. So, um, And then I also want to be mindful of sort of what kind of curve I want that tail flip to have. If I want it to be kind of a steep little kick or if I want it to be more of a, a shallow curve here. And actually you can see one side of my knife cuts one way, one cuts the other way. So, um, any rate, you don't have to get this perfect here. 
because this is just the early early stage. And the other thing to remember is right here is not the finished height of this part of the spoon. In fact, it's going to come down a fair bit below here. This this rim is going to angle down like this. So this has room to sort of have a little hump here and then come down as well. So uh, at this stage, I'm going to cut the top of the rim. And these cuts with the top of the rim here, um, two things. One is you'll notice that I'm not bothering to cut the center of the, the bowl. I'm only cutting the side, and that makes it easy for me to concentrate on the the curvature of the rim itself that I'm actually cutting, right? The only part I care about is what this looks like on the actual edge, because all this stuff in the middle is eventually going to get hollowed out. The other thing I want to make sure I do is completely eliminate that axe mark. Let's see if I can get this close enough for you guys to see. See how there's an axe mark right there? There we go. And you see that bit of clear wood between the end of the axe mark and the rim here. That part is super important to make sure that I establish that clear wood between the axe mark and here. So I need to go down until that's completely, um, until I have that, that couple millimeters of clear wood. Um, and if I don't, then I need to keep going until I get underneath that axe cut. Okay, so that's one side, and it's, it's a pivot cut. So rather than using this arm to pull towards myself, I'm actually lifting my elbow up and out, and that's pushing the knife down because this connection of my knuckles to my fingers here is acting as a pivot and then my thumb is safely out of the way. So then the other side is another pivot cut but using this thumb here as a as a knife stop and I also find it useful to brace the end of the spoon on my leg and that just sort of holds it still. Otherwise I'm trying to hold all of the tension with these fingers and it's exhausting. So brace the end on the leg, do the first part of the pivot, and then you can either switch to, I call this the pistol grip, right? Because it's pretending that it's a gun, um, which allows you to see it, which is nice because you can see exactly the cut you're making. Um, but it's a little more tiring than this cut, the reinforced pull cut where you're sort of pulling towards yourself. Either way, this line that's being created here is going to end up getting lower and lower here and here. And that allows you to bring the top of the handle here down. And again, you can see that I'm going into the center, but I'm not messing around. All I'm doing is making sure that there's clear wood on either side of this chipped in part. And also that I am establishing whatever line I want to establish. So, um, and then you also want to look at it from one end and the other end, make sure that it's roughly even. Again, there'll be plenty of time to adjust this. And then the other thing you want to make sure is that you maintain a certain thickness here. Right here tends to be the part that gets a little too thin, and right here. Um, this thickness here allows you to change this curvature without changing the way it looks from here. So um, we're gonna. the next step is we're going to pull up the, the bottom and make this thinner by about half. So we're gonna pull that up to about there, but we're gonna maintain a certain amount of thickness to the rim so that we can continue to adjust it. The deepest point of the spoon bowl should be basically mirroring, mirroring the deepest part of the rim. So you can see the deepest part of the rim is right here, deepest part of the spoon bowl is here. So that's the point from which all cuts flow away from on the back. You can see this is the this is the area where a lot of people do the chicken wing cut, and I just find the thumb push gives me a lot better control of what I'm actually cutting. If I did the chicken wing, I would end up over cutting and not achieving the curvature that I wanted. I would actually achieve a reverse curvature. Um, so I can more on the the thumb push. Okay, so now you can see here on the front of the bowl, I've pulled the rim up. And now I'm going to cut the curvature on the back of the bowl. If anyone has any questions as I go along, feel free. I'm mostly doing this because while I have 
videos that explain all this stuff further back in my YouTube channel. It's just a ways down, and I thought I'd do another one for people just finding it now so they don't have to watch too much of me before they get the information they want. All right, so I was able, because of the way the wood grain was, to knock off this back corner a little bit, but because the grain is slanted within the spoon, let's see, slanted this way, I was not able to get this corner. This corner is going to have to be gotten coming from the opposite direction. So in general, if you're carving and it feels like it's starting to split the wood, stop immediately and come at it from the other direction. Um, and in general, these shoulders back here get cut in this direction. I was just able to cut the other, this shoulder I'm working on now a little bit because of the way the grain is oriented. Okay, so I'm just knocking off the back weight of the shoulders here. And then I'm using the chest pull to pull down towards myself. And what I'm doing is I'm creating the line I want for the, for the bottom of the spoon. It's not a perfect parallel mirror of what the top line is doing. It, what I prefer is to have it taper over the course of the handle. Um, again, that's just me. And you'll also notice this handle is still quite thick. That's going to get taken down more. But the spoon carving process is one of sort of slowly reducing the variables to the finished dimensions. And by not taking everything to the finished dimensions right away, you are leaving yourself room to react to the situation on the ground. As you get into a spoon, sometimes you'll find that the grain tears out a certain way or you mess up a little bit. And if you do what I'm doing here and bring it down a bit at a time, then you can let your actions respond to the situation. So you can see here the sort of taper that I like. How long do I usually keep my spoons? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. How long do I keep them like in the house? Uh, usually I'm carving spoons for other people and they, they ship out once a week. Um, Jay, you've answered my question about the transition point between the top of the bowl and handle. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, pleasure. Um, so uh, if, if I didn't answer that first question in the way that you were hoping me to answer, please ask it again. Um, okay, so now you can see, let me sheath my knife here before I stab myself. You can see the rim is about half what it was. The shape, I'm not trying to get a perfectly symmetrical shape. Um, oh, how long do I keep my spoon? Let me just go back here. Uh, second. How long do I keep my spoons measurements wise? Aha. Uh, so this is an eater and this is eight inches. Um, I tend to do long handles compared to almost everyone else I know, and part of that is because um, I like my hand to be out of the bowl when I'm eating. Um, so if you imagine a bowl, if you have a really short-handled spoon, then your hand has to be down in the bowl. I think I have a theory that Instagram is slowly pushing us to uh, carve shorter and shorter spoons because Instagram is a square picture format. and so. Um, um, the closer you can get to something, the more the grain shows up and the more positive feedback you get. And so then the next time you carve a spoon, you think, oh, I'm going to carve one like that square short handled one that got a lot of likes. Um, like for instance, I know that I get a lot more likes on my scoops because they're so square that I can get real close to them. And then you really notice the wood grain, but the actual function of an eight inch eater uh, if you look at your average cafeteria spoon, it might be a little bit shorter than an 8-inch eater. It might be 7 inches, um, but I just find that 8 inches or so is just about right um, for what I want to do. Okay, so now, um, so now I'm going to draw the shape again. I'm going to tilt this down. Okay, so when I draw the shape, I tend to start at the neck, and I sort of define the neck width that I want on my finished spoons, right like that. And then I try and get a sense of, is the handle in line with the bowl, or is there a slight mismatch? In this case, the bowl is tilting this way, and the handle is tilting this way, just slightly. Um, and 
So I can untwist that by adjusting what I draw here or adjusting my draw here or a little bit of both. Um, in this case, I have plenty of room within the handle to mess around and I also have plenty of room in here. So I'll do a little bit of both and, uh, and that should take care of it and I'll end up with a handle that's perfectly aligned with the bowl. So if I'm going to try and redraw the line of the handle, I don't do it in open air. I, I, I rest my hand on my leg and that allows me to pull back and draw a straight line. Um, okay. Alright. Okay. And then when I'm drawing symmetry on the spoon bowl, uh, how about oriental soup spoons? Yeah, those are a whole different thing. Um, those are, uh, those are, are a whole different ball game in, in a lot of ways. So when I'm redrawing the shape, you can, uh, line up something straight in the middle of the bowl. It's easy to see which side has more material than the other side. And I always redraw the shape on the side with less material on the theory that whatever I draw here will definitely fit here because this is bigger. So I'm going to start drawing my shape here and then I'll copy it on this side. And I find when I'm trying to draw a nice curve here, like a nice egg shaped bowl, that if I keep turning the spoon I end up with a better result than if I just hold it in one orientation and try and draw it. This stage of redrawing the spoon in the middle of the process is absolutely critical for me um, because I find that if I don't do this and I just try and adjust it by eye, I, I have so much mission creep. Um, they look like a cross between spoons and scoops. They are, yeah. Um, yeah, and they're designed to sit flat. They usually have a flat bottom and they usually have that sort of groove in the thumb. It's just a whole different thing. Um, so drawing is critical for me to keep myself on track for this next stage. If I don't draw the shape, I find that I don't end up anywhere near what I intended because as I start carving, it, it, it fools my eye into doing things that I wouldn't otherwise do. Okay, so now I have the outline and I'm basically going to do the same three steps that I did earlier where I cut the bandsaw cut around and then I'm going to cut the top face and then the bottom face. And again, all cuts <clears throat> go from this widest point away, so this way towards the tip or this way towards the neck. And um, I usually do the tip first. You can do them in whatever order you want. I just, at this point, I just have a system and I just do the system. And then the joy for me comes not from trying to come up with a system in the first place, but all the little variations that happen in the process of carving a spoon. That's what keeps it interesting for me. Because no two pieces of wood are alike. And they will challenge me in different ways. Okay. And I'm also trying to challenge myself to get better at making cuts cleanly and smoothly the first time around, etc. So for instance, that cut. Not so great. There we go. That's better. All right, now the top of the shoulders here at this stage, um, I'm going to cut down the handle first because when I stop this cut down here, if I had already taken the time to clean up the shoulders, um, then I would then create a kind of a clean line. So before I clean up the shoulder, I'm going to trim down the side of the handles. I mostly use the uh, the thumb push and this chest pull, and then I also use you know the the other cuts for um, for doing the spoon bowl, and then those lever cuts for doing the rim of the bowl that we'll go over again. But yeah, I where other people tend to use power cuts or chest lever cuts, I use the thumb push because I just find it's much more accurate, um, gives me a lot better results. So. All right, so now 
this is how you keep from overcutting the neck here is that you you only let yourself get down close to your finished line once you are at the sort of finished stage so that you don't keep going back to that neck trying to clean it up you give yourself one chance to get it as clean as you can and then you walk away once you get the the form of it correct and the surface of it as good as you can um, this goes back to the, my latest blog post on surface versus form right where right here I'm coming in with just the tip of the knife and again if, if your knife has too much belly here if it, if it comes out steeper and then goes down to a more of a parallel line and then angles in you're gonna have a hard time in this tight transition here you need that really fine point of a Moro 106 or something like it and you also this is the test of how sharp your knife is because if the tip of the knife isn't adequately sharp you aren't going to be able to sort of ghost up the grain of the spoon the way you are here so the trick is you always want to come down the spoon neck leave it attached and then come around the shoulder and exit going up the spoon neck um, you're never going to be able to come down and exit going across the grain of the shoulder here like I wouldn't be able to come down and then exit out the shoulder here it just it's not it's almost never physically possible um, sometimes I can come down the neck like this and exit before I reach that shoulder but I have to be super controlled and careful about it and again the pull cut you are generally not controlled enough to stop yourself from doing these little nicks here that you see so um, so that's why I have this order of operations where I come down and then I do the thumb push going up and at that stage of cleanliness I leave it I might clean it up a little bit later but at this point there's no use tracing chasing it further so on this side I can't see any line because it's on the, the wrong side so I sort of eyeball where I want to start and the line I want to pull and then because I'm looking down my knife here I can see the line I'm cutting and I can see how it compares to the other side of the handle and that keeps me more or less on track sometimes it takes several cuts um, this is also where you get these fantastic curls here which is just really lovely um, and then again at this stage what I'm doing is I'm just eyeballing the weight of the spoon bowl from side to side so at this stage I then come around the shoulder with a thumb push and I'm trying the reason we got that rim so narrow is that with a narrow rim like that you're able to do a thumb push going around and you're able to sustain it for longer than if it was wider the narrower this is the more of a long controlled curving cut you can take um, and then you can see I'm starting to to cut up here but I haven't reached the depth that this one is I actually have reached the depth in the front but I haven't in the back so I need to be mindful of that and adjust my cut okay so now I've come out but I still have a little bit of cleaning up to do and I want to be mindful of going as parallel as I can and not digging in any deeper than I absolutely need to and this again is going to keep me from overcutting the neck here You'll also notice that I've left the neck fairly deep at this stage, and that's that deep keel is just kind of insurance. It it is allowing me if I if I need it because I created a particularly narrow neck in the process of cleaning this up, then I then I have it. And if I don't need it because I successfully clean this up and it's fairly wide. Then I can reduce this keel here um, a certain extent. Um, so at this stage, the best way I know of to tell if something is symmetrical or not is to hold it up against a, a lighted background and squint your eyes so that all you see is the dark silhouette and you can get a pretty good idea of where exactly it needs to be adjusted to um, to become more symmetrical. I used to be more obsessed with symmetry um, and I still am to the extent that I sort of am constantly pushing myself to be better at doing it in a casual sort of way.
but I am not obsessed about getting every last spoon perfectly symmetrical. I figure they are pretty symmetrical, and I do the best I can, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna agonize about it. Okay. So Okay, so now we have recut this line. Oh, I haven't cut the tip here. And you can see how this tip, which is quite jagged right now, uh, in the process of cutting this tip, I can make a much cleaner cut. And this is still a thumb push, by the way. This is still basically me bracing the knife tip with my thumb and pulling back with my fingers to get this cut here. Um, hey, Blake. Hey, Peter. Um, so, there you have it. There's the top there. So now is my chance to re-sweeten uh, these lines. In particular, the rim of the spoon is going to have been uh, messed with by trimming in because as soon as we trim in we get to this higher stuff in the middle here. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start with the rim and let's go over these pivot cuts again. So I, I start pressing into my chest, finger holds it in place, thumb rests behind, then this knife gets pushed into these fingers here and that allows me to get from 12 o'clock down to four or five o'clock and really all the way around to six o'clock here on the spoon face and it also allows me to really see the line I'm cutting. I don't know if you guys can see the line I'm cutting here but and it's a very shallow angle but this is the line that I this kind of curvature is what I'm going for in my spoons. I want it to not be too pointy at the tip, fairly flat at the tip, come down and have it be fairly flat straight line with just a little bit of curvature. And um, and then most importantly, I want it to be low in the back here. I don't want there to be these tall shoulders that you get if you don't cut this down. So you can see how deep I push that swoop there. Um, this is cherry. Um, so then the other side, so the one thing I'm going to do actually is I'm going to cut the tip just a little further because you can see how the tip is a little bit pointy. It comes up to a point. I generally don't like that because of how it feels in your mouth. So I want it to be fairly mellow. There we go. Good. Now I'm going to cut the other half. And again. It's holding it like this and this, like this. 12 to 6, that's a long time for one cut, exactly. Um, and there we go. And then I can lift my finger out of the way and get this cut all the way to the end also. Now I'm able to look at this cut from this side and then also from the back here and see if it's symmetrical here versus here. Now's the time to adjust that cut. There's still going to be a little bit more that you're going to do back here. Once you drop the chamfers down the side, then I'm going to have to go back and sweeten up this line. So I wouldn't agonize too much about what's happening back here and here. Um, but certainly this is where you want the front two thirds of the bowl to be just about right. Now, just looking at this, I can see that I've got a lot more weight on the center of the bowl than I really need. If you take a look at um, you know, an eating spoon, just a metal eating spoon, I think you'll be shocked at how shallow it is. Um, and as long as the bowl is appropriately sized and fairly blunt tipped, it will actually hold a surprising amount, provided you cut it narrow, uh, thin enough. Um, so you don't need it to be particularly deep bellied. So I always cut the back starting with the center line because whatever I do with the center line is going to define what you see here on the bottom. Um, yeah, my pleasure. So I start with that wide center facet that goes all the way and the, the most common thing I see is people fail to lean into the cut as it comes here. So they'll lean in and then they'll chicken out and then the, the, the rim, by the time it gets to the rim, it's actually a little thicker than it should be. So 
have to keep beating into that cut and get it to actually come up tight. And you can see how tight I'm pulling that rim up there. That's, that's so you can see I'm actually basically having the rim again. So now, now I've got that center line. Now I'm going to start out at the rim itself and I'm going to get that rim nice and tight all the way around. And then once I've got the rim exactly the way I want it, then I'm going to blend the lines in between. That is the best way I've found, the most consistent way for getting a consistent curvature on the back of the bowl while getting the rim the exact thickness that I want. Because the problem is if you start in the middle and work your way out to the edges and try and achieve the rim thickness you want, you might not get that taper just right, the curvature just right, and you end up with either too fat a rim or too thin a rim, or the curvature isn't consistently flowing throughout. So by setting up the rim, the, by setting up the center line first, and then setting up the rim on either side, you know exactly what needs to happen in between the two to achieve a sweet taper right okay so now I've got the rim perfectly down and I've got this center line and I can see how much I need to cut here versus here um, to get the back of the bowl to be the way I want it to be and again I do all of this with thumb pushes and I try and make the thumb pushes as long and sustained as possible and whether you're shooting for specific facets, whether you're shooting for a look that has uh, sort of loose facets, whether you're shooting for a look that has you know almost no facets, that's just a matter of sort of what you do after this point. But I think this is a good strategy leading up to that point for for no matter what you're planning to do. So now you can see I've smoothed it all out. And I've got fairly consistent. It's a little fatter on this side than it is on the other side. I'm not too concerned about how getting this perfect right now. I'm just getting it sort of within close enough parameters. Because once I get it tight enough that I'm actually carving the bowl, I'm going to start putting it in my mouth. And my bottom lip will be able to tell whether very subtle differences in whether one side is thicker than the other. Um, there's really no substitute to actually putting it in your mouth as far as I can tell. So now I'm going to redo the line on the back and here's a chance for me to adjust the height of the keel based on uh, how thick I was able to maintain this. You just want yours to look like a spoon. <laughs> yeah well that's true also. You gotta go Blake. Are you going to save this video? Yeah uh, I think I have room on my phone so I should be able to upload it to YouTube. Thanks for watching. Um, so now I'll adjust this height based on how much I need to maintain to maintain stiffness. And then uh, depending on how, what sort of cross section I want in the spoon, it doesn't always pay to make this super thin because then you can't do interesting chamfers. So um, I'm more concerned with what's the line that I'm seeing when I look at it from the side. And do I like that line? So, good, now I need to re-trim the top. You can see how on the top there's some subtle places where it's just not as smooth a curve as you would think. It's funny, as the spoon gets more refined, you, your ability to discern little wobbles and imperfections also gets increased. Um, which is good because it means that as you go from rougher to more and more finished you can create smoother lines but I never try and create those lines right off the bat so you can see here to get this little bump down here I always switch and go back my bet uh, my pleasure Blake have a good day at work um, all right so now Got the lines there that I like. I've got the underside of the bowl is good. The rim is basically pulled up. The last thing I need to do is, is adjust the back of the shoulders here. And again, part of it is getting the rim a nice even thickness.
and the other part of it is pull, pulling in the back to be a little bit tighter. You can see how here, I'll do one side and then I'll show you compared to the other. Um, it would be easy in this process to really cut back the, the keel here too much. Um, and so you have to sort of do these cuts where you lean into it and then you lean out of it again. Um, leaning in, leaning out. Okay, so here's one side appropriately cut down and you can see how this side and you just needs to be pulled in this material back here needs to be makes a big difference to remove that material so again i start with the rim get the rim consistent thickness and then i'm making sure that i'm exiting out of the cut enough that I don't overcut that keel in the back. And then I'm just blending these lines because in this case I'm looking for a spoon that doesn't have distinct facets in the back. But there are all sorts of facet combinations you can do that are fascinating back here. I just, that's not where I'm at right now. Okay, so now I'm ready to start pulling my facets down. Let's see, you're starting to see that you ham fist it too much. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's easy to sort of try and push your way through stuff that you need to finesse. And I think particularly for us guys, that's um, a natural tendency to try and just um, sort of keep keep pushing ahead because we're used to using our strength to kind of make things happen and that comes back to bite you uh how fresh is this piece of wood this piece of wood is freshly axed into a blank about half an hour ago and it's from a log that came down a little more than a year and a half ago and it's just been kicking around the log and i harvested a round of it maybe two or three weeks ago so it's still fairly fresh but it's cherry heartwood and there's very little moisture in it. Um, and the fact that it's been sitting in the log means that it's just very mellow. Okay, so now the spoon is symmetrical. Before, and you'll notice that I haven't done anything with facets yet. So before I do anything with facets, I wanna make sure it's symmetrical, it's even, it has the lines that I'm looking for from the top and the side. Because at this point, once I start pulling the facets down, uh, you lose the ability to sort of establish those parameters. So I want to make sure they're established before I start pulling facets. I always pull my facets on the back of the handle first, unless there's some reason that I should do the front of the handle. Like I think there's an issue that I need to address first. Um, I don't know why. I think it's just the habit of when I do it. And here I actually brace the knife against my side and pull out to get a nice clean facet like that. Hi. Hi. Mom, I'm, I'm live teaching. Do you oh, need something? Okay. Is this yours? No, that's yours. This? Yep. Yep. It's uh, part of your canoe rack strap. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so here you can see the grain changed and it started to tear out just a little bit. So I'm actually coming back at it from the other side. and feeling it out. See, it's, it's tearing from this direction also, which tells me that it wants to be cut in this direction just for that tiny little bit, and that actually I was going in the right direction for most of it. But it's always good to be cautious and explore when, it's, when you start to experience grain tear out, just to kind of stop and figure out what it wants to have happen. Um, so again, I find I have the most control over making these long cuts if I brace my knife and pull out. 
Um, stream keeps interrupting for you. Not sure if it's your cell signal or my stream. Sorry about that, Chuck. Um, I know I had trouble at first, although I haven't seen it freeze up on me. This will be posted, it'll be saved, and it'll also uh, go to YouTube, should. Um, okay, so now I've got facets on the back. Um, lately, I've been much more interested in creating forms rather than just a series of facets. So the way I create those forms is by pulling multiple facets to create curvature. So you can see now that those multiple facets have created a curved back here. Um, yeah, sorry, Chuck. Um, and then uh, I, I might decide to do micro chamfers like this down each of the spines as well, just to make it that much softer or not. It's my mood and where I'm at with what I'm thinking about stuff. But you'll see that I'm trying to be pretty systematic about it. I'm not just, you know, doing it all over like with a scraper. Um, is anyone seeing a bunch of intermittent starts and stops? It's not showing it for me. Um, okay, so now I'm going to do facets down the front of the handle. And I'm careful maintain just a little bit of thickness you can see how narrow there and that maintains this dimension here um, just like that and Okay, so once I get the facets, however, however I actually want them, there's still this transition to the bowl that I have to adjust, right? Because they come down here and there's a little spot where they, they pop off. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Rita. Um, and sorry, Chuck. So this is the spot where the grain changes. And so right here, I'm going to have to recut the rim and get underneath that little bit, right? So this is where I'm looking at it from the side. I can see the curvature I'm making. I get under. I don't want to overdo it. I want to just, whoop, just like that. Just the tiniest little thing. You can see how that gets that cleaned up just like that. And um, when you recut this rim, you want to make sure that you don't create a bump right here. You can see how there's a little bit of a bump in the rim right there because I cut down lower here than where it was fared in here. So not to worry, I still have enough rim that I can go in and re trim that line and get so it's a nice sweet curve okay good good the lines I want here nice bit of grain tear out here so I'll come at it from the opposite direction see if that cleans it up it does well enough I'll knock some micro champers off again micro champers are where you just have these little tiny shavings and all I'm doing is just taking off the tiniest little corner because I don't want those facets to have hard edges. I want them to be more textural than that. There are some places where you, I think it's super important that you knock off the edges, like on the inside rim of the bowl, because you feel it with your mouth and it really affects how pleasant it is to use a spoon. But on the handle like this, I think of it more as a design choice rather than kind of obligatory to make a good spoon.
Okay. So now I've got the handle that I want. I've got the cross section of handle that I want. Um, I've got the rim recut the way I want it. I need to trim the end of the handle. Now, you can do any number of things to trim the end of the handle. The thing I've gravitated towards recently is doing a narrow chamfer that I do sideways across the grain. Rather, so rather than cutting up like this, which makes lots of sort of straight choppy bits, I go across the grain and then um, that allows me to then sort of recut the top so that it's a little bit rounded. And what I end up with is a surface that is like a domed, rounded top to the spoon handle that meets at a distinct line the sides of the handle. And um, that's just what I'm doing right now. It's just the most interesting thing for me to do. You can see how it's domed. There's no hard lines on it, but it meets at a distinct line at the top of the handle. Um, okay, this is also my chance to address any situations like there's a little extra material here. Now again, this is where it's easy to overcut something and get yourself, you know, ruining a perfectly good spoon. So you have to know what your limitations are and whether you think you can actually pull something off. If you can't, don't try it. Because you have a perfect spoon right now. Okay, so you'll notice I haven't done the bowl of the spoon yet, and that's because uh, I like to wait until the very end so that in case I encounter some problem and I need to adjust where the bowl is, as long as I haven't hollowed out the bowl at all, I can adjust that bowl indefinitely within the space. I can make it smaller and smaller and smaller, I can shift it from one side to the other, but as soon as I hollow out the space, I'm limiting how much I can adjust it. So, um, so that's why I do it that way. Okay. Good. All right, so now I'm gonna hollow out the bowl of the spoon. I tend to always hold my hook knife like this, where I've I've actually got, this is a rounded spine here, so it's not sharp the way that more hook knives are. It's, it's nicely rounded. Um, and again, this hook is by Matt White, Temple Mountain Woodcraft. And he makes a beautifully rounded spine here, which allows me to put this right here, in here and choke up on it like this. And what that means, I just have a lot more power. If I were to hold it back here, I have way less power and it wouldn't be as safe as if I hold it choked up. What it means is I have a lot of power and also it's it's much harder for me to cut myself because by the time I get close to my thumb, I'm fully choked up on my fist like that. Um, so, I tend to start in the middle of the spoon bowl and sort of work a trough down, unless it's a round spoon bowl, in which case I start in the middle and start spiraling my way out. And what I want to do is start in the middle, work my way down, and out at the same pace so that I reach finish depth and finish rim right around the same time. And I'm not trying to pull uh, a lot of material off any one spot because this is where the spoon is really starting to get fairly delicate. And you want to um, be pretty delicate in your movements. Now I am doing using quite a fair bit of force here, um, but uh, part of that is that I'm always providing oppositional support with my thumb. So I'm always pulling towards my thumb. If I wasn't providing oppositional support and I was just trying to use the rotation of my hand or, um, or not even that, but just doing it like this, I wouldn't have nearly the power. So it's always about having my thumb on the opposite edge from where I am and pulling towards that thumb. And that really gives me a lot of power and a lot of control. And then rather than 
come up and over my thumb, the way you see some people advocate. I say just stop before you get to your thumb. Just stop. And, uh, and you can see the two basic cuts are either I'm holding the stem of the spoon like this, and it's in the palm of my hand being supported, and I'm either coming across the grain or going down with the grain. Sometimes I'm cutting with the tip of the knife, right? Like here I'm cutting with the tip to do this shoulder here like that. Sometimes I'm cutting with the, the back of the knife. So on this shoulder, you can see I'm using the back part of the knife. Sometimes I'm using the curvature of the edge itself to define the curvature of the rim. And then other times I'm holding it like this. But again, it's this thumb on the opposite rim that's really keeping things um, powerful and in control. And you can see that I'm staying back from the rim in any given area until I get close on all the areas. And also that I'm getting fairly close to my depth also. So here we are. Um, on one side of the spoon bowl, there's always going to be a, a point at which it starts to chatter. And you can usually turn it around and come at it from the other angle. If your hook knife is like this one and has a continuous curvature and, or, or a compound curvature, if it's too open and shallow a curve, then you won't necessarily be able to come at it from the other direction and use the tip. You'll be stuck using the, the back like this. And that's why sometimes people think that they need a right and a lefty hook knife because their hook knife has a basically a limited range of utility because of its curvature. Um, but with this hook knife that Matt makes, it's a continuous curve and it gets up, it's leaned forward enough here that it gets out of its own way. And you can see I'm able to get into this cut right here with the blade still lifted up out of the way here. So I'm just continuing to go around and around and basically whatever areas got the most material, that's where I'm attacking and pushing it down. And similar to how I, on the outside, I, I made the rim the right depth and then blended the curvature. Here, I will sort of push the rim out a little bit and then blend the curvature of the cuts on the inside. And I'll blend and blend and blend for a little bit. And then when that feels like I've blended it in appropriately, then I'll go and I'll push the rim out a little bit further. So I'm always establishing that rim the way I want it to be, and then using that as the, the sort of the goal post of what I'm shooting for and blending from there. Now, I used to make my rim all one thickness all the way around, but then I realized that it's actually uh, feels much better in your mouth if, if you can go down to almost no rim on the sides here and then keep a little bit of rim here and a little bit of rim back here. Um, because that super narrow rim on the sides just means that um, it just feels a lot better in your mouth, particularly if you put a chamfer on it as well. So. Um, that's what I shoot for now, and pretty much all of my spoons have a variable rim thickness, meaning not meaning that it varies randomly, but that it is very specific to the purpose of the spoon where the rim is slightly thicker than other places. Um, okay, so I've got my rim the way I want it. Right, and now I'm blending in the middle here. Um, <laughs> glad to hear it. Uh, send me a message. Send me a message. Happy to make you a spoon. Um, so, all right. So now's the chance to just get that rim exactly the way you want it. Because I'm awfully close.
part of how I can tell that I'm awfully close is just from experience. But the other part is that I'm going to start putting in my mouth because it's possible to overcut the center of the bowl and make it too deep and actually make it so that it's uncomfortable that you, when your mouth is fully on the bowl it's too deep for your front lip to get down into and that's a problem that is very difficult to fix after the fact it's much better to sort of see it coming and creep up on it and not actually hit it so yeah I'm getting fairly close it is too thick here but we'll adjust that later how often do I sharpen my hook knives? I sharpen my knives in general. I sharpen them about once a week. That's every 10 or 15 spoons. I should actually be stropping this a little because um, I can see that it's not, it's not as perfect an edge as I can get. But I've actually come to realize that um, while my standard for what a good sharp edge is has changed since starting to strop, I still believe that... Um, you know, you want the sharpness for the sake of performance, but I don't think you necessarily have much to gain in terms of appearance within certain parameters because people actually gravitate more towards spoons that are um, not rough, because this isn't rough, it's quite smooth, but. Um, you can agonize too much about making it absolutely perfect. Um, so one other thing that I just realized we need to do is because that center of the spoon was high up here, you can see how that line actually kicks up there a little bit at the end. So one of the things we do is just push that line down. And we need to do that now before we finish carving the center of the bowl because it influences how much we need to carve there. Okay, so so now you can see that line goes down better. Um, and now I know what I truly need to get to with the hook knife. Just a little bit back here. The two places where it's easy to not cut enough is right here and right back here. Um, for whatever reason, those are the areas that it's easy to under carve your spoon bowl, and you end up sometimes even with a little bump. I see in people's spoons there where they just needed to take three to five more cuts than they did. Um, And so at this stage, what I'm shooting for now is to get a consistent curvature on the inside. Um, not so concerned about getting absolutely perfect surface because while I do try and get the perfect, most perfect surface I can, I find that if I focus on the surface and not on the form, um, then the form is almost always lacking. Whereas if I focus on the form, the surface will end up being as good as I can make it while still getting the form right, and that ends up being a better compromise. Um, there's always a point at which you need to walk away from the imperfections and recognizing in yourself your ability to do that or not is an important thing. So, getting awfully close. It's just this one spot here where there's just a little bit of a bump. Let's see here. 